Good morning, church family. We're so glad you're here. If you're not already standing, would you stand with us? We're going to worship this morning. Come on, let's put our hands together.
can it be that there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the Son of Son. Some imagine. Some imagine you are distant and removed, but you chased us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace, and the broken you were grace, and in the end the proof is in you. in your wounds. Oh, blood and tears, how can it be that there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah, hallelujah to the 
that all the glory. It is his kingdom that will never end. The kingdoms on earth will all come to an end, but not God's. It lives, it reigns, he reigns, his kingdom lives forever. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you will live forever with him in his kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That just makes whatever you're facing right now today manageable, doesn't it? It's manageable. I might not like it. I might not want to do it, but I can do it because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and you. You sound good this morning. You don't sound as loud as the women did on Friday night, but you sound good. And we're really, really glad you're here. Would you help me say happy birthday to Hannah? Today is her birthday. Happy birthday, Hannah. And on Tuesday, it's Pastor Shirley's birthday. So you guys be sure to give a big happy birthday. I see her back there. Thankful. You guys can take your seats. We're going to bring tithes and offerings to God this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. And we will be glad. Aren't you glad? I'm glad. I want to read three scriptures uh, to you from the book of Philippians. Uh, Paul wrote these scriptures to a church that he loved very much. And I think they're very appropriate for me to read them to you and over you this morning. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. It says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. In every prayer of mine, I always make my entreaty and petition for you with all joy. I thank God for your fellowship, your sympathetic cooperation and contributions and partnership in advancing the good news, the gospel, from the first day you heard it until today. And I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing and perfecting and bringing it, that good work to full completion in you. I believe that for all of us. And I do thank God for you. And I thank God for your partnership and your fellowship, your contributions, and your work in advancing the gospel. I just want you to know, church, that the things that we do together week to week make it possible for people that have not heard good news to hear it and to come to know Jesus. And what we do week to week together enables us to do extra things like we did this week on Friday night, extra things that we did for Easter. And it's because of all of the fellowship and the contribution and the cooperation together that those things are able to be done freely for all that can receive it. The things that we do uh, can be offered freely, but they are not free. It costs Jesus his life, and it costs us to continue to spread that message today. It, the, the, there's no cost to the person that wants to receive it, but it did cost, and people do pay for that word to get out. Jesus started that. He's the one that paid the highest price. And you and I, we continue with our cooperation and with our contributions to be certain that that message continues to be spread all across the earth. And so I just, I want to say thank you to everyone who prayed. We prayed, we did extra work this season to pray for Easter, to pray for Women's Night. I'm telling you, it made a difference. Every prayer that you pray makes a difference. You might not see it right in your face, 
It's not, it's not like going to the ATM machine and putting your card and your code in and getting the money out. It doesn't work that way. There's a spiritual activity that's at work when you and I come before Father and we ask Him things in His name that are His will, that He goes to work to see that it comes to pass on earth as it is in heaven when we ask. So thank you. If you climbed a ladder, if you pushed a vacuum cleaner, if you held a child, a camera, a mic, a drumstick, a guitar pick, if you held to open a door for somebody with a smile, if you passed out parfaits and booklets, if you, did, if you cleaned up the mess that we made afterwards, <laughs> thank you. Any contribution that you made made a difference. All of you that invited people to come to church with you, keep doing that. Do you know that on Friday night, we had almost 50 first time guests because they were invited. They were invited. They were invited and they said yes. Some of them may be back this morning and maybe they'll be back again and again. Thank you for inviting people. Some people say, why do you do all that? Why do you do decor and desserts and shopping and pop-up shops and fun things and put crazy stuff on the platform? Why do you do that? We do it because it sets the atmosphere for the women who are usually doing those things for someone else. And this time it's done for them to say, you're welcome here. We want you here. We want you to be able to relax and enjoy and not do on this night. And all of that happens because of the offerings, the, co the cooperation and the contributions that the church brings every week, week to week. It enables us to do what we must do and reach beyond that. So please know that, that whether you bring little or you bring much, it all gets put to good use and it all goes out. It's serving to keep the word of Jesus Christ and the good news of the gospel to go out in a world that would love to shut it down. We cannot let our voices be shut down. We have to continue to speak in love with truth so that people know the truth of Jesus Christ. Do you agree? Most of all, I just have to say thank you, and I think you will join me in this. I have to say thank you to God the Father. God the Father, loving all of us. Loving us. Jesus, our Savior, and the Word made flesh, and Holy Spirit, who inspires us still, who helps us understand the word. For me, that was very, very special this weekend because for more than a year, mo many, many, many mornings, most mornings, I have awakened with Romans chapter eight, verse two, in my mind and in my heart. It says that for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed me from the law of sin and death. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes all the difference in every one of our lives, spiritually, mentally, financially, socially. It makes all the difference. The spirit of life is in us because of Christ Jesus. And unknown to Rachel, Rachel's Tuttle stepped up on the platform Friday night and said, let's turn to Romans chapter eight. I believe Holy Spirit had a message for all of us about the spirit of life that we all can partake of, not just in a special event, but as we walk out of here today, as we go home, as we go to school, as we go to work, as we go drive in this crazy city, in all those places, 
the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is imparting fresh life to all of us. I think that is worth me contributing and cooperating and giving my life to. And I believe that you think that too. So as you give this morning, understand that. It's more. More is happening than you just dropping something in a bucket or pushing buttons on your phone to make the contribution. That thing that you're doing in the natural is resulting in spiritual, everlasting results. And we thank you for it. Can we pray? Father, I thank you for the givers. I thank you for those that work, that those that pray, that those that sow. I thank you for every contribution that is made. God, I believe that you return it back to them because it's your nature. You said, if we refresh others, we ourselves, we will be refreshed. You said, if we give, it will be given back to us in the same measure, in a multiplied form. And Father, I thank you that in heaven there is no inflation, there is no shortage, that you have ways that you help us to stretch what resources we have and that you supply all of our need as we keep you in the foremost and first place in our lives. I thank you for the gifts that are being given and I thank you for the good news that will go out because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Host team, would you come and serve the church, please? And uh, while the containers are coming past you, would you give your attention to the video screens for announcements? Thank you, church. Hey, good morning and welcome to Believer Center. We're so glad you joined us this morning. If this is your first time here, we have a special gift prepared for you in the foyer and want to answer any questions you have about the church. Our heart here at Believer Center is to deeply love God and wholeheartedly love people. So if a bag of food would help you or your family today, you can head to the guest service table after service to receive a bag of food. And if Believer Center is starting to feel like home, we'd love for you to become a member. You can start our membership course today at BelieverCenter.com. To stay connected with everything we're doing here at the church, make sure to download the Believer Center app and follow us on Facebook and Instagram where we have content from our staff and daily inspiration. Thanks again for joining us today and here are some important announcements. What's up church family? Happy Sunday, best day of the week. Whether you're watching online or you're in the house, we are glad that you are a part of service today. Well, Friday night was incredible. Mom, come on, let's make some noise for the ladies night, the turnout. But we could not have done it without our volunteers, all the people that showed up Tuesday to help set up, make things look good, the behind the scenes, the cleanup, uh, the people on worship team, everybody on production. Thank you so much uh, for everybody that volunteered that night. We could not have done it without you. You made the night a million times better. So we're so grateful. Let's make some noise for our incredible volunteers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But well, we don't have a lot today, but we do have one thing for you. April 28th is new member celebration. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to actually dance. But we're excited for New Member Celebration. If you're wondering what it is, New Member Celebration basically is an opportunity for you to learn the vision, the heart, the direction of the church. Now, a lot of different churches do it a lot of different ways. But how we do it here is if you go to BelieverCenter.com, you're going to see a menu bar in the top right corner of the website. Drop down and you will see the class and the option to take so you can become a member of Believer Center. And you know what? Some people are like, member, what does that mean? It just means that basically you are a part of the family. You understand the values that we stand by and you just want to be a part. And that also will give you the option to serve and get more plugged into what we are doing here. So it only takes about an hour. It's just a handful of videos, an hour max, depending. I like to get a little popcorn snack on it when I did mine. It was a good time. So get the membership class done. And then on April 28th, we'll recognize you and pray for you 
and believe the absolute best for your future moving forward into the church. Well, we had worship, we had the announcements, now it's time for the Word of God, and we're in week two of our series, Jesus, Our High Priest. So would you do me a favor and stand on your feet and welcome Pastor Marshall to the platform. Come on, let's get excited. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. So much of the church was involved in um, the uh, women's one night. Um, how's your energy level? <laughs> we worked hard, and uh, maybe your body's a little tired, but you know, your spirit is still ready and always ready. And uh, we'll be uh, a great, great asset, of course in you hearing and receiving and understanding of what we're going to talk about from the Word again today. As Javi already stated, we're in a second week of Jesus, our High Priest, or we're really talking about how to get help when you need help. Because of what the writer of Hebrews said, he said, we have a great High Priest in the heavens at the right hand of the Father, and we need to come boldly to Him and obtain both mercy and grace in our time of need. So receiving mercy and grace, obtaining your need uh, in your present situation is doable. And we want to talk a little bit more about that this morning. And then next week, we'll finish the series uh, and talk about some real, just practical, what does that look like? How do I go before uh, Jesus, my high priest, in prayer? What does it look like? How, what do I ask for? What should I expect in the moment? We're going to cover that next week. But we're going to talk a little more in detail about uh, what has happened uh, that would put Jesus in that position, sitting at the right hand of the Heavenly Father. He has an immovable, listen, immovable priesthood. That wasn't true under the Old Testament. It wasn't true at all. They had to get, they got, about the time they got used to a high priest serving them, he would pass away. He would die. And so a new person was ordained high priest and stepped into that place. And, uh, but Jesus lives forever. And so his priesthood is better. In fact, if, if you want a key to understanding the book of Hebrews as you study, it is the word better. Say it out loud with me, better. And it just talks about, again, a number of different details about how much better uh, with Jesus and now under the new covenant people are than they were under the old covenant which would come to an end even when it was begun. God's plan was to bring that to an end and then open up the world to a relationship with God. And that happens uh, because Jesus mediates for us. He is our Savior. He is not just Messiah to the Jews. He is Messiah to the whole of the world. And, um, and so he has also become uh, the mediator. Again, that's something else. There's only one mediator between God and man. You don't have to go through anybody else when you have a need. You can pray with uh, other people who have God's Spirit within them, who have been born again, who have, the, again, the Spirit of God living on the inside of them. They know how to pray for you. Many of them do. And so you don't have to go through these stairs and through these personalities and through these steps in order to get to Jesus. You can go directly into His presence. Why? Because of his blood and because of the high priest ministry he has today. I saw a comedian on uh, Instagram, found a clean one. And, uh, but she's so, so funny. I think she is. But she was talking about being raised Catholic, and it's not a put down for, uh, concerning Catholic people. God loves us all. And there are believers, true believers in every denomination on the, on the planet. God knows who they are. He knows their name. But, uh, but she was talking about being raised a Catholic, and she would say, you know, you Christians, you just go straight to Jesus. She said, I had to go, first of all, to my teacher. Of the, uh, you know, I had to go to um, uh, uh, talk to them first. If that didn't work out, I had to go over here and, and to find a saint that I could pray to that covered my area of need. And then she went on and named some other personalities that she was taught that she had to go to before she could ever get to Jesus. 
But aren't you glad today it's just not that hard? Those of you who know your Bibles know that that's just not that hard. We don't have to go through anybody else. You know, when I first came to Albuquerque, and just for FYI, if you don't know this, I was raised uh, as a Southern Baptist. And um, we, we just couldn't stay there once we began to learn some things and, and desire some things that we saw in the Scripture, in particular in the book of Acts. But, um, you know, we, we were there and uh, uh, raised in, a, in, a, in a, a faith, in a religion that didn't really uh, emphasize the priestly ministry of Jesus. I'm not saying they didn't talk about it. They just didn't help us understand it. They didn't help us grasp hold of how the realities of his priesthood help us today in our present day walk with Jesus. So um, when we begin to just look into the scripture, we begin to see something just unfold to us. We just hope we're unfolding that for you here. Amen. Uh, we want to, we want, I want you to always enjoy teaching that you can trust. You can go to your own Bible. You can find it there. If you want to study it out, if you're hungry for it because of the Holy spirit and the hell of the Holy spirit for us. And so today let's pray before we get into the scripture, uh, for a little while and, uh, believe that God is uh, going to be heard. He's speaking that he's going to be heard. And we're going to gain some understanding today, and it's going to equip us in a practical way to enjoy his priestly ministry and to enjoy more of the abundant life that he came to give us. Are you all in for that? Father, we thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you said when you left that he would come and that he couldn't come until you left. It was important to you to talk to your followers about this one called the Holy Spirit. And the scripture encourages us to have a deeper communion with him. And so we're gonna enjoy that today, Holy Spirit. Thank you for being here. We know you're gonna lead us. We know you're gonna guide us. You're gonna train us in truth. You're gonna transform us. You're gonna cause the desires of God to be our desires. We'll be one with his desires the things that he wants. And we'll walk out uh, together in agreement concerning those things. And we will begin to enjoy more and more and more of Jesus, what you call the abundant life, what you called the overflow life. So we thank you for it. Open our hearts to you. Receive what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen and amen. Praise God. Before you're seated, let's go ahead and do uh, our creed together. This is our, our, our creed. Uh, we often declare it together when we come together, most often on Sunday mornings. God gave us this some years ago, decades ago, just to declare uh, over our lives. And so if you don't know the words, they'll be on the screen for you. If you haven't memorized them yet, they're also on the screen for you. But let's declare this this out loud in faith. I am deeply loved and graced by God. His life is a gift to me. My life well lived is my gift to him. I am determined to live the life I could never deserve from the place of his grace. My faith is audacious, my spirit relentless. I will not be deterred, I will not. Until Jesus is fully honored in a hurting world has heard the good news. Then who? If not here, then where? If not now, then when? I am deeply loved and graced by God. One more great round of applause and welcome to Jesus. Amen. Say a quick hello to somebody there around you. Maybe introduce yourself to someone you don't know, and then you can be seated. So very little of the timeline, again, just uh, for those of you who didn't begin the series with us, we didn't get very far into it, but we just noted that there was a lot of activity taking place as Jesus hung on the cross. 
And then uh, after he was buried in the tomb, there, was, there were a number of things happening. And say, so what? Well, so what? Those things uh, legally um, established uh, redemption for lost mankind and is of even greater importance to those of us who have received Jesus Christ as Lord. You need to know this if you don't already know this, that our redemption is both legal and we call it vital or livable. There's a legal side of it where God took care of everything and made sure that sin wasn't just, so to speak, you know, swept under a rug, uh, giving Satan the opportunity to bring it up every time he wants to bring it up and to use it to separate us from uh, the love of God and to somehow break down our relationship with Jesus. So Jesus covered everything legally. It's one of the reasons that salvation had to come by a man because our lostness came by a man, Adam and Eve in the garden. And so our redemption also had to come as a man. But that man would have to, to live a, a sinless life to become a representative for and a sacrifice for all of lost mankind. And so that's what happened. And all of the details pointing up to the time of the cross, including Jesus uh, living that sinless life, qualified him to be our chief high priest now. Obviously, if he had sinned, the Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. If he had sinned, he would have disqualified himself to become the propitiation for our sin or to become our representation uh, in the work of uh, redemption. So he, he did that as well to, uh, how do I say this, acquaint himself in a, in a real intimate way. God so loved the world. So he went all the way in acquainting himself with what you and I face as human beings in a world that is still governed by the God of this world, even though, and again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about that again today, but even though he has been, the Bible says, spoiled, and I'll show you what that means if we have a chance this morning. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, those that work with, cooperate with, carry out the work of Satan, the God of this world, they were defeated. Come on, somebody. They were completely defeated. The resurrection is proof not only that Jesus paid the full price, but proof also of their defeat. Amen. And because he is victorious, because he lives and is victorious, you and I live. And we can live victorious lives. But he went through being tested by Satan. He went through being tempted by him to fail, uh, to turn his back on God the Father, and he wouldn't do it. But he did that in part, again, as we'll see here in just a minute, be able to note it. He did that in part because he loved so deeply and he wanted so deeply to be your help as you live on and desire to do the will of God on the planet. Uh, scripture says after he took his last breath that he descended first. Again, that's a sermon in and of itself. Why did he go into the uh, dark regions, or as some people say, the place of the dead? Um, why did he go there after he had uh, commended his spirit to the Father God? Well, that's where uh, all men who uh, had faith in Christ and who did not have faith in a coming Messiah went. In fact, the spirits and souls of all dead men before Jesus came and did what he did, went into a, a place called hell uh, in, in the heart uh, of the earth. Psalm 22 talks about it. Psalm 16 talks about it. So you can find it there. It's hard for some Christians to swallow that, that Jesus went first. The Bible's clear about it. In Ephesians chapter 4 is just one place. But he went first before he ascended to the right hand of the Father. He, he went first into the lower parts of the earth. At that time, that, that, that uh, place called hell by some was made up, and called hell in Scripture, by the way, was made up of two compartments. I mentioned to you, uh, this to you last week just as we were coming to a close. There was one side of it that was called Abraham's bosom. And the other side of it was the place of the, the damned or the place of torment. 
if you did what I asked you to do, if you were curious in Luke chapter 16, we find that story that Jesus told concerning uh, those two compartments. And there was a, a one man who was poor, name was Lazarus. He didn't have much when he was on the planet. When he died, he went into Abraham's bosom. By the way, when the thief uh, on the one side of Jesus at the cross uh, had, had said, remember me when you come into your kingdom to Jesus, Jesus said, this day shall you be with me in paradise. That was that side of Abraham's bosom, referred to as Abraham's bosom, paradise. And on the other side, again, the place of torment. The rich man who had lived his life in great abundance, when he died, he went to the place of torment. He was begging those who would give him voice to please go and, and, and warn those who were still alive of what they're facing. And so Jesus had to go first. That's where all men went before he paid the price. And some men say he went there because he became sin for us. I believe with all my heart he became sin for us. I don't believe that happened in hell. I believe he, that happened at the altar of the cross. You see, again, Jesus is fulfilling his entire life, really, and then his time uh, on the cross and his burial and then his resurrection and then his ascension. He is fulfilling a number of different shadow types that we can read about. We may not understand them, reading about them in the Old Testament, but Jesus was the fulfillment of all those. At the very same time, Jesus was outstretched, pouring out his blood and talking with the Father. At one point, you remember what he said? He said, my God, my God, what? Why hast thou forsaken me? I believe with all my heart that that was the time that Jesus took the sin of the world on himself. And God could not look at him in that moment because he took upon himself the sin of the whole world. From that place, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. The Bible also teaches us that he preached to spirits there. He hasn't yet, by the way, some of you are wondering, I can see the question mark right here on your foreheads. When did he go and sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat in heaven? Well, he did that uh, after he did the following. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, and remember, she wanted to hold on to him and to embrace him. Remember that? And he said what to her? One translation says, he said, don't touch me. That's not what it really says from the literal Greek. It says that he said to her, don't, don't hold on to me. He said, because I've not yet ascended to my father and your father. So Jesus is on the cross. He dies. He's taking the sin of the world. He goes to the lower parts of the earth where all the spirits and souls of dead men since forever uh, have gone. And the Bible tells us in uh, Psalm 22 and 22 that he declared himself to those uh, who had died. We don't have exactly what he said. I'm sure that was some kind of sermon, don't you? But he declared himself, which means he, he let them know that he was the one that would be sent for their redemption. Because there were a number of people who the Bible says died in faith under the old covenant looking forward to to the deliverance that their Messiah would bring. So Jesus goes into the lower parts of the earth and he declares himself to be that promised one. We don't know what else he, he spoke of. We don't know what else he preached. But the next thing we see him doing, the Bible says, is he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. Colossians 2.15 says, Then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their authority and power to accuse you. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. You know, you, you hear somebody say, we know, what, yeah, amen. It deserves a clap. But you know, when we, 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 we hear people say, the devil made me do it. You know, he never makes you do it unless you're possessed by him and you've lost the power of will. As long as you're not possessed of a devil, actually possessed by him, then you're making the choice. I'm making the choice to sin 
The devil doesn't do that. Part of the reason for that is they can't. They no longer have the power to do that. What they use, they use the strategy of deception. Watch this. To get you to use your resource for their sake. They want you to live your life still for them. You're awful quiet. You thinking about this? Because really Jesus said, if you resist the devil, he'll do what? He will flee from you. The word flee means to run in stark terror. We need to have that picture operating in our, in our souls. Can I have an amen there? Rather than, oh God, here comes the devil. We need to have instead, well, he's already been overcome. If he comes and I resist him, scripture's clear. He's the one that's going to flee, not me. Well, that rhymes. A good preacher will always make stuff rhyme. All right? So he will flee, the Bible says. Get that picture in your mind. Again, why? Because you're a super-duper saint? No. But because of what Jesus did for us, come on, on our behalf, he was, he, he led, in fact, it's a, it's a play on, uh, it's an analogy used by uh, Paul here as he writes to the church at uh, Colossae. It was a known fact. In fact, Paul lived it during his day. Jesus saw it, saw it during his earthly ministry that when a Roman emperor, a general went out to, to fight and he won a great battle, what he would do after he, he won the great battle was is that he would ride on a mighty steed horseback into the city uh, and there behind him he would have the spoils or the treasures of the defeated enemy behind him. And last and certainly least were the foes, the enemies that were defeated. And they were chained up and they came up last in that uh, victory uh, procession. Does that make sense to you? So Jesus is making a play on that. I mean, excuse me, Paul is making a play on that. And he also does it with the, when he talks, writes his letter to the church at Ephesus. He talks about how Jesus first descended and then ascended, leading captivity captive and giving gifts to men, which is a real nice turn of things because that victorious general or victorious emperor often received the spoils for himself. He gave some to the one who commissioned him, but he, he kept a lot for himself. Our Jesus, as our representative, after the victory of the cross, he led all of the enemies of God, the spiritual enemies of God, he led them captive, and instead of keeping all the treasures for himself, he turned to us and gave us gifts. So just another Another something special, a nugget, golden nugget that God gives us in his word concerning how selfless Jesus lived his life. And even as he was being raised from the dead, he was prepared to take what he deserved and share it and give it away to those who, who believe. That's why you and I can say from our hearts, we really are rich. We don't always feel like it. The bank doesn't always agree. Our bank statements. But we are rich above all, all people. He says, because all things are yours. And again, that's because of Jesus. Not because uh, we've done it right, always done it right. So let's, let's just talk a little bit more about uh, this, and, and I'll let you go for the morning. Let's look at Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. Again, Jesus' victory was complete. Ephesians tells us about it. Uh, while you're turning over to Hebrews 4, 15, and 16 and getting ready for it to come up on the screen, I urge you to look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 21. Again, where Scripture says, Jesus is far above all principality and power, might and dominion. Every name that's named, come on. Every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. The 22nd verse says, He has put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church. I said this last week, uh, three things. Jesus has new, three new job titles, if you will, or areas of responsibility. Since his re resurrection, he is king of kings, and he is lord of lords. So he is ruling from the right hand of the heavenly father. Amen? He is also called the head of the church. He had told Peter one, one day and his disciples, 
I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He has been doing that since the day of Pentecost. That work will come to an end at the rapture of the church, if you're wondering. The church age had a beginning, a certain beginning, and it will have a certain end. During that time, you and I have the privilege, and it is a privilege, the opportunity to work with Jesus, who is head of the church, in building the church. Whoever you were who invited those 50 people, who turned up Friday night, those 50 ladies, okay, you were working hand in hand, arm in arm with, step for step with what Jesus is doing to build his church. The church doesn't grow by just transferring one's membership to another. The church only grows when we win someone to Jesus Christ. When someone really gives their heart to Jesus Christ. That's how the church grow, grows. And we have this assignment, all of us, we, the church, have this assignment. It's our only assignment in the church age. And that is to go into all the world. You and I, I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way. A lot of times it doesn't. But you and I have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. We've been set apart for God's purposes. And God's purposes for this age He has given all of us who are Christians today, really Christians, he has given all of us an international ministry. Soak that up. You have an international, worldwide ministry that God's going to hold you accountable for and me accountable for. And we do that one soul at a time. Using whatever platforms God gives us, Ministering not in our own ability and power, but in the might of the Holy Spirit to go and bring people to Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to join with Cindy in saying thank you to all of you who take the time and make the effort, not just like you did this past weekend, but every day you just you stand ready to share the good news of Jesus and the love of God with somebody, not just with words, but with your actions that represent who he is, that reveal who he is. A priest long time ago said, always preach the gospel and sometimes use words. I love that. So he's far above. Uh, the Greek word there means he's, he's uh, high above, far above, and refers both in rank and dignity, excuse me. In the context of this verse, it means no one in the universe has a higher rank, name, or position than Jesus Christ. Think about it. He said far above all, the word all just means that. It means anything and every, everything. So Jesus has been given in his priestly ministry, in his kingly ministry, uh, as head of the church. Uh, he has, he's been exalted to the most highest place that is available in the universe. He is literally above all. And again, the Bible says, above all who, everything, anything. But he specifically mentions principalities. It's a word which denotes rulers of the highest level. It refers to all human rulers, including kings and politicians. And is also used to refer to angelic beings. Presidents, heads of states, prime ministers, kings, chancellors, or head of governments, as in Morocco. They're all under Jesus Christ. There's literally no one in the natural or spiritual realms that holds a higher rank than Jesus. Have you been encouraged by this at all? Then Jesus used the word powers. It's a word which refers to those who have received delegated power, often translated as authorities. It refers to those who have been entrusted with public office by their superiors or through an election. Come on, be of good cheer. It's an election year. I rhymed again. Be of good cheer. It's an election year. Guess what? They're not going to have the final say. And you got stuff in you that grieves you the way the Holy Spirit is grieved. Because we've all got opinions about it. But if you've got something in you that grieves the way the Holy Spirit grieves, pray. Pray in strength. Pray in authority. Release power to change our cities, families, our cities, you know, our nation. 
desperately needs to find her way again. She has lost her identity. She doesn't know who she is or who she was meant to be. There are a handful of people that are still praying and know how to pray the will of God concerning the nation. I want to be a part of that group. I don't want to be an angry angry Republican. I don't want to be an angry Democrat. I don't want to be another person who just now wants to start another party to be angry with. Wow, what happened? Spirits got involved. Demonic, dark forces got involved. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Amen. And as hard as it is, remember this, because it's going to get hotter and messier as we approach November. God is still not willing that any man perish, but that all, say all, All. come to an acknowledging of the truth. Boy, sometimes it's hard to pray for some of these people. Can I be honest with you? Some of you have been real honest with me. It's hard. It's hard to pray for the souls of some of these people that are backing with their lives and with their resources the darkness in ways that couldn't possibly agree with what God thinks and what God wants to do. It's hard to get on my knees to mention their names, but God gives me help and you help in your time of need if we're available for it. He gives us mercy when we failed at that because mercy does what? It creates a new opportunity. Grace is the power of God to fill it with success. So think about that. Mercy makes room for needed grace. And grace comes in many different forms to help you in all the weak areas of our lives. Amen. There's a, gra- there's a grace for every weakness. There's a grace to empower us to go where we can't go on our own or we don't want to go and yet it's the will of God and just remember that and so as we he said dominion he used the word might he used the word dominion all the same uh, different terms uh, dynamis might is the word dynamis it means explosive power it's actually used to describe full strength of military force there is not a force on this planet a military force on this planet and this will make your brain go tilt that is mightier than the name of Jesus Christ. Not, if if I'm going to believe my Bible, and I am, that the greatest powers on the earth, even combined, the name of Jesus is greater, and the might he has and releases to us is greater too. Amen? So as you lament what's happening on our planet, just remember these things. Because of his lordship, because of his, uh, his headship and his high priest ministry, you and I can exercise from his place of authority, exercise his name and see all of these other things that are influencing our world and affecting even our own personal lives in a positive and a powerful way. He mentions in that same verse, he says he, he, names, he uses the word names. Paul mentions names, the Greek word sonoma, which might actually include personal names that might strike awe or fear into one's heart. Certainly been those people in history in Jesus' day, Paul's day. Caesar was a name that everybody quivered over. When his name was mentioned, literally people shook because of his position, his might, and his power. Um, Hitler, some of us, uh, you know, may have survived that, that era. Mussolini, those were names that, in history, that, again, struck fear or awe. Stalin was another. In our day, it might be, Xi, it might be Xi in China, or it might be Putin in Russia, the former Soviet Union. It might be Kim Jong-un in North Korea. But you know what? The name of Jesus is greater. I said, oh, I love this. The scripture is so clear. Why are we afraid? We should, you know, again, it's easier said than done. I agree, and that's one of the reasons we, you know, we we take a stand with wherever you are in your life. We want to help you to a better place. 
a higher place. But when you're afraid, just know this. You don't have to be. You can if you want to be. You can choose to be. You can cite everything that is against you and the force and power that people have gathered or Satan and his cohorts have gathered against you. But guess what? You don't have to be afraid of his name or what he can produce. Instead, they have to flee at his name. And his name, again, is so powerful, you don't even have to shout it. His name is so amazing that you don't even have to shout it. All you got to do is mention it. I just say it out loud. Don't shout it. Just say, Jesus. Say it. Jesus. The mere mention of his name. Every knee will bow. The scripture says, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Can we give God a, just a clap there as we're about to close. I just close this, this, just put this, plant this seed in your heart if I can here today. You know, when I've needed help, and it's been so many times lost count in my own life, just, just walking out this, this uh, journey of, of life and faith, uh, there are just like three qualities that I always look for in people. Uh, and I think about these qualities before I even think about really approaching them for help, ever even asking them uh, for help. And the first one, they have, to be, they have to be qualified. Say that word with me. Qualified. qualified. Um, I've got a few of those, and again, just naturally speaking in my life, uh, God has gifted me with some incredible friendships, and, and uh, I can go to them with some confidence that if I go to them and ask for help, they're going to give me the right kind of help. Maybe it's a yes, maybe it's a no, but maybe it's something I didn't even think about. Um, I'm thinking short term, they're thinking long term. I'm thinking long term, they're saying, yeah, but what are you going to do to get there? I thank God for those kind of relationships, don't you? I just, they're gifts from, from God. And, um, and, they, and, and I would go to them because they actually know what they're talking about. They've actually been where I've been, maybe. They've done what uh, I'm preparing to do. Amen? Amen. And uh, wouldn't, wouldn't that, you know, I called someone out the other day, hot water heater, started leaking from the bottom. I came home to water flowing out into the garage, onto the garage floor. First thing I did was call someone who's helped me so many times looking for advice. I called Gordon Eden, and he recommended this company. And I called up this man right away, and his name just happened to be Joshua. Do you think God did that? I don't care. I don't know why the devil would introduce himself as Joshua. But uh, Joshua, and he turned out just to be an amazing guy. And he came out, he, you know, helped me figure out what we could do and what, what we could, you know, exchange this heater with. We, he just went over the different scenarios and, and uh, he was very honest with me. He said, most people like this, they hate this feature. You know, I just want to give you the overall what you need. This is really expensive, but in the long term, it'll help you. This is a short term solution to what you want. I mean, he laid it out before me. And while he's doing this, in addition to that, he's telling me what kind of plumber he is. He's actually told me one, at one point, he says, you know, I know it sounds stupid. He said, but I don't, I don't mind at all getting on my face and pushing my head in a hole. Okay, is he telling me the truth? But you, you know, he just said, I have done this all my life. I was a kid. This is what I did when I was a kid. And he said, it's worked out for me in a career. And he said, my company depends on me. And, and he really seemed to be someone qualified. And so I was able to make our decision in part on that information. The second quality, think about this with me too. They have to, be, they have, to have integrity. You know, uh, you, you got to keep your word. Church family, come on. If you really want to really magnify Christ in your everyday life, if you make a promise, keep it. If you tell someone you're going to be here at a certain time, be there at a certain time. 
Do we mess up? Yeah, but we don't make that our way of life. It's not our lifestyle to plan to be late. You know, I, I think this, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can tell me that I'm wrong, all wrong, you know, washed out about this. But I think that if we really believe that Jesus is the one who calls these meetings, he's the head of the church, that he's the one who says first day of the week, set apart the time he gives us some liberty as to win. But if we really believe that, we'd do everything we could to get here on time or before. I'm just saying, I didn't even look to see which ones of you came in late. Don't put your head down. Nobody's after you. Just think about it. If someone invites you to dinner and you say you're going to be there at 630, you should be there at 630. It's godly. It's the right thing to do. It's the righteous thing to do. If you can't and you don't want to, tell them that. That way they'll know to say, okay, we're going to start at 630. You come whenever you can. I think in the end, it's all we have. I tell pastors all the time who come to me for some advice about, pastor, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do this? Should I do that? You know, I, I want to do the right thing. I, and I just, without hesitating, somehow I get this into my advice for them. If the only thing you've got at the end of the day with your church family or with anybody else is your word. And if you fail, seek them out. Make an apology. Let them know you were sorry and that you'll work to do better. Amen? Don't stay at a place where you're, you know, where you missed it. Make it right. Get back on track. And the next time it happens, then keep your word to them. Isn't that right? So qualified integrity and the last thing is just, if I can get this, I don't always get it, but if I can get it, I love for them to be personal. I love for them to treat me, you know, like I'm not, you know, just everybody else. Not because it, I'm, I don't say that in, uh, in a, any arrogant sort of way. I just, I want them to look me in the eye. I want them to shake my hand. I want them to treat my need like it's, it's my need. Even if a zillion other people have it, I want them to treat me like I may be the only one that they'll get to serve that day. It's, you know, I think about that a lot in my experience. It's golf lessons, same kind of thing. You know, I I had a golf teacher who was absolutely amazing. Sadly, he is no longer here on the planet. I can't get any lessons from him any longer. And I know some of you are looking at me and you're saying, Pastor, please don't drag this out. I hate golf. I hope you get saved before Jesus comes. <laughs> I do. Okay. Just saying. But, um, you know, same thing. I look for these things. I look for uh, someone who is qualified, of course. Let me see. And in fact, I've done that with golf teachers, including Jack, who passed away. I said, let me, let me see your swing before I sign up. Put my name on the dotted line before we partner up. Let me see your swing. Because people can talk the golf swing and not know how in the world to do it, right? They can talk it good, but they don't have an actual good swing. And I know enough, when I, I know enough to, to recognize what's a good golf swing and a bad golf swing. And mine's bad. So I know the difference. And I'm searching for higher ground. So, but I look for that in him. I look if, to see if he has any integrity. Is he or she going to do with me what they promise to do. In other words, they say, if you take lessons from me, this is what it's going to look like. We're going to do it at this time, uh, this day of the week. We're going to, you know, we're going to do it consistently. This is what we're going to be looking for. We're going, to work, we're going to notice things that are good in your swing, things that are not good in your swing, and we're going to work on the, these sorts of things. We're going to leave the good things alone and, and start treating some of these really bad habits you have in your swing. Uh, and, and then that he actually does that, or she actually does that. And then the final thing is, I don't want him to treat me like he treats a hundred other students. I want him to look in my eyes. I want him to deal with me. I want him to talk to me like, he's, like I'm actually there. And he's not thinking about his next lesson. Okay, maybe, you, maybe I just, you should just stop with this. Because some of you go, I don't get it, Pastor. I don't understand. 
Well, just try to transfer these into some area of your life that you care about. Amen. I just happen to, to love golfing because I really do think it's a game much like life. I really do. And there are a lot of lessons in it, too. You, you know when a guy like me loves golf, when he's not just watching it on TV when he gets a chance. He plays it every opportunity he gets. But he's also watching it on TV, and he's listening to it on radio. And that's someone who's got it really bad. Amen? But guess what? That's true about Jesus being our help. He certainly qualified. Hello. And that's what we've been talking about. That got him to this high priestly ministry place, along with being head of the church, along with being king of kings and lord of lords. He certainly qualified himself. And again, the writer of Hebrews, if you'll just give it a, a good read, really about the fourth chapter, it's really, really uh, an easy read. It's tough, but it's an easy read there. He starts, the writer starts talking about some of these qualities. So Jesus is certainly qualified to be our high priest. Again, the Bible says he was tempted in all points. Say all points. And whatever those are in your life, he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. And the Bible tells us that he did that so that he could be a faithful high priest. That's where integrity comes into play. Amen. And Jesus is faithful, the Bible says, to a thousand generations. His name, that's why we pray in his name and not our own. One of the reasons. He's faithful to a thousand generations and will be as a high priest for each and every one of us. But that last one really gets to me. There's no one more personal. He's got all of these responsibilities. He's got all of these different things that he is actively carrying out right now to the pleasure of the Father God. That last one, he's determined that, and, and you just need to be confident in this. I don't think our minds can wrap, wrap around it. That the King of kings and Lord of lords, hallelujah, the head of the church, the great conquering king, combination of king and priest, which was totally, the only other person mentioned that had those two offices embodied in one person was Melchizedek. Jesus, he combines king and priest. That king and priest, that great mighty conqueror, over all principalities and powers, mights and dominion, every name that's named not only in this world, but also in the world to come, has been given a name that every knee will bow to. He is your chiefly high, he is your high priest. He is the one who has the more excellent ministry, as the Bible describes it. And he loves to see you. He wants to be with you. He wants to enjoy time with you. And when you're all messed up, you know, and you think, I'm just going to stay away from the throne of God. That is the very time to go there. When you're all messed up, that's when you need the help. That's what the writer of that verse said. When you have, you're in your time of need. I'll get, to, I'll get to feeling better, Pastor, and then I'll go have this conversation with God. No, you're missing it. He's the one who gives you that. When you've had your worst day, that's where, when you go to your high priest. Amen? That's when you go. I, I learned this some time ago, and let me share it with you, and I'm done. Is that God taught me that even when I mess up, and especially when I mess up and miss the mark, it is still not the devil's business. It's none of his business. Your business is none of his business. Yeah, but he was a part of my sinning. You don't have to discuss it with him. If you sinned, you already had a discussion with him. Come on. So you stopped. You're ready now to get right. God's got cleansing for you. Clearly, the Bible teaches that. Don't waste any more time talking this over with the one who tempted you in the first place. Usually that comes, that conversation in your head comes by what we call, what the scripture calls condemnation. And the word condemn means to declare unfit for use. 
The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, why is that? Because your sin has already been paid for. It's already been dealt with. Period. Satan doesn't want you to know that. Satan wants to keep bringing you back into bondage even though you're free from it. But the one thing you don't want to do is start up a conversation when you miss the mark with the one who brought you into that failure to begin with. That's the time. Listen, God didn't turn his head away from you. He's, he's coming after you. Just like he did Adam and Eve in the garden. He was in hot pursuit of them to help them. When you and I sin as believers, okay, because of his commitment to do his ministry, his love for us, he's in hot pursuit of us. He's calling our name. He wants us to turn and respond to him. Receive the cleansing, the help, the mercy, and grace in a time of need. Does that help you this morning? Let's go ahead and stand our feet today. And we will just together thank God for his, his word. But before we do that, you know, I'm going to ask that you just bow your head, please. And if you're here today, here's what I want to give you the opportunity to, to do. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, and you know that deep on the in, inside, Or if you're always questioning it, you may never have invited Jesus to be Lord of your life. He is Lord, and as we've already seen, there's a day coming where every knee will bow, whether willingly or unwillingly, in that day. But you know if you really have an established relationship with God or a walk with with God, or you don't. And if you have that question, I'm going to invite you to pray with those who, who would say, no, I don't have that relationship. Go ahead and pray it anyway. Just settle it in your heart. That when you, the Bible says this, Scripture overrides our feelings, everything else. Scripture says that if anybody will bow their knee to his lordship, believe that he is Lord, confess that he is Lord, And believe in your heart that he's alive, that God raised him from the dead. Again, he had to do that for salvation to be legally right. It was already lovingly right. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. But for it to be legally right, he had to do all those things we've kind of touched on. Things I'm hoping we'll we'll still think about once we finish the series. Because those all qualified him to be in that place. And now qualified with the greatest integrity and with the amazing, I call it personal touch. If you were the only one who needed the new birth today or salvation, Jesus would still hang on that cross, cursed, so that you wouldn't have to be. So if you're here today, let me see your hands. Just want to pray for you where you are in, in, in your seat. If you're here today and you say, I don't know Jesus in that way. Pastor, that you talked about today, I don't have that personal relationship with him, that 24-7 thing. But I want that to change today. And I'm ready to let Jesus be Lord of my life. He is Lord, but I'm ready to let him be, be Lord of my life. Would you raise up your hand high? Let me see that you're here in church service with us. and We're going to pray with you. Somebody right over here on the front row. That's so powerful. Anybody else? Right here? God bless you. Anybody else? Another hand? Yeah. Yeah. God is at work. Don't you love it when God goes to work? Amen. All right. Okay, you can put your hands down, and I just want to see now others of you. Who you, you really say, you know, Pastor, I'm just not sure and I want to be sure. Will you, will you pray with me this morning? Will you have the church pray with me? Again, would you lift your hand and let me see that, that we have people like that that we're praying for? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you, you don't need to go through life wondering whether or not you have eternal life. And if you've done what Jesus said to do, which is not try to work for it and earn it, deserve it, but you've received it by faith, you can be confident when you leave the campus today 
and you go out into your Monday morning, that God lives on the inside of you, that you received eternal life, that it is a settled issue where the throne of God is concerned. And it'll bring you such peace. You're just, just such peace. Amen. I still remember that day. In 1973, it happened for me. The moment I made Jesus Lord of my life, my life didn't become perfect. It couldn't. But the peace that I knew I had with God, things that had been settled with God, was incredibly real and just overwhelming. And so, church, let's do this. Let's just raise our hands to heaven, all of us, one hand. And we're going to pray this prayer with those that raised uh, their, their hands. I counted one, two, three, four, at least five, maybe six, who wanted to receive Jesus as Lord, and then others who said, you know, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm just not certain. And we're going to pray for them. You ready? Let's say it out loud together. God in heaven. So grateful for Jesus and what he did for me on that cross so long ago. Today, I make a no turning back decision. To let Jesus Christ be Lord of my life. I believe He is Lord. And I believe He is alive. That He loves me. And He paid the price. The ultimate price. So that I could be redeemed. Forgiven. Receive eternal life. Become a part of the family of God. And so I believe that today as I confess His Lordship, I enter into that relationship with Him. And according to the Scripture, I am saved. I am born of God. I receive eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. And let's say a resounding yes, yes, yes. Come on. Amen, yes, amen. Yes. Before you leave, if you need a Bible, we're happy to give you one. Make sure you have one. That's where we find out the things that are so important while we're here. God takes that Bible and He takes the words off the pages and somehow, by work of His Spirit, gets us to understand them and to grow in them. You'll never know God without, without your Bible because that's where God has revealed Himself. So um, uh, be sure and tell somebody what you did today. We saw you raise your hand, but before you leave, turn to at least one person. Those of you who raised your hand said, you know what? Today, I made Jesus Christ Lord of my life. April 14th, 2024, I may Jesus Lord of my life. Amen. And the last thing, of course, we want to invite you to, uh, to, to, church, to church and back to church. You know, this is a, a beautiful church family. It's not the only one in our city. Uh, God has a place for you in his church. And uh, he wants you to be more than just a visitor, more than just a spectator. He wants you to be someone who participates um, in church life. You need it. I need it. We all need it. Again, that's by, by God's design. I don't really, I don't know where I would be without my church family. I really don't. They're very special to Cindy and I. And so you're going to need one too. If this is the one, come on. We welcome you with open arms and we're ready to help you take the next steps for your life. Amen. Amen. Good church. Yeah. All right. Listen, special speaker, not next week. Well, he is special. You put me in my place. Thank you for that. And you keep me there. But I was, what I was trying to get to is that a week from Sunday, we do have a special guest speaker. Pastor Don Kaywood is coming to speak uh, to our church family. Pastor's a great church in Odessa, uh, Texas. A beautiful, beautiful church. And uh, he's also a member of our board of elders, our board of directors here too. He's here to help us with some uh, uh, decisions we're making to move the church forward, but he's also here to speak uh, life to you. He's always got a great 
uh, word for you. Come, always comes prayerfully prepared and otherwise to speak into your life. So next week we'll finish this series. And again, we'll get on uh, the practical aspects of how do then I receive mercy and grace in my time of need or, you know, when I need it. We'll talk about what that looks like.